science goes to the movies and look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. Today, we have one of our favorite guests, Dr. Mark Siddle of the American Museum of Natural History. Dr. Siddle curated the Disease Eradication Exhibition, A Countdown to Zero, which ran at the museum, the Carter Foundation, the Museum of Science in Boston, Abu Dhabi, and of course, the Gates Foundation. Welcome, Dr. Siddle. It's really great to be back here. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. A little crazy, but well. Sure. Today we're going to discuss the startling prescience of Steven Soderbergh's 2011 movie, Contagion, as well as the excellent movie Dr. Siddall suggested called 93 Days, directed by Steve Bukas, that dramatizes the heroic, heartbreaking, and true story of how Nigeria eradicated an Ebola outbreak in just 93 days. Mark, watching the movie 93 Days, it's very clear that the world we live in is connected, complicated, and fragile. And in 2014, when the movie takes place, did the whole world dodge a very serious buckshot kind of a bullet due to the heroism of Doctors in Lagos? Yeah, I, I, really think, I really think we did. Lagos is this really important place in Africa. There's an enormous amount of economic development and so forth going on. It's a, the city is about as crowded in terms of density as San Francisco. It's got probably three times as many people in it, though, as, uh, as all five boroughs of, of, of New York. So imagine dropping Ebola smack in the middle of Mexico City and trying to deal with that in a situation where there's things like stressed infrastructure and things like that. The, the first case in Nigeria was a diplomat from Liberia. He certainly had symptoms before he left Liberia, which means he was on a plane flying from Liberia to Nigeria symptomatic, and he could have been spreading it to people on the plane. What did the Nigerians do right? They kind of got everything right. Uh, they did a really good job. Well, they were on high alert because, of course, Ebola was sort of raging to the west of them over in Sierra Leone and, and so forth. And so they were already on alert. This guy was actually plucked uh, out of whatever line or whatever he was in because he was symptomatic when he was at the airport. Uh, and so they got him right when he came in. That actually reduced the number of contacts that he had uh, uh, right away. And this contact tracing thing is what's really, really important. They, they deployed a whole bunch of things in Nigeria immediately. They got out, they figured out who his contacts were. There were about 10 primary contacts, and then there were maybe another 300 other secondary contacts who were contacts of that contact. One of his contacts actually had flown to another city and they traced that and then all of that person's contacts. And in the end, they had like 900 and something primary and secondary contacts. And then they did the contact tracing and they did follow up interviews with these people, like I think 18,500 face-to-face interviews. They did testing right away, not just on this gentleman who came from, from Liberia, but for other people who were in the contact trace list. And they were able to get all that information together in a central command structure, deploy a huge healthcare workforce, not just for the contact tracing, but for education as well. Well, let's just, let's jump to contact tracing because in the movie 93 Days, this patient zero, he's rich and powerful and very angry at the staff at First Consultants Hospital for even suggesting that he might have Ebola because, for suggesting that he might have had some contact with the jungle. And, and also in Contagion, we see poor dead Beth Emhoff may not have wanted everyone to know who she saw and what she did in Chicago. And the contract tracing can be very complicated because not all humans want all their human contacts to be made public. But why is this issue so vital to epidemics? It's the one singular way that we have always been able to get out in front of a breakout, an epidemic, or a pandemic. And it doesn't matter if it's smallpox or polio or guinea worm. Guinea worm is nearly eradicated. There were like eight and a half million people or maybe more than that that had it not too long ago. President Carter's operation has driven that down to 22 people a year. Polio, you know, there's fewer than 60 people who get polio a year now. It's been eradicated or eliminated from the, from the, the new world. And it's even where there's no vaccine or drug. You can get out in front of these things, as I think Hong Kong and Taiwan uh, showed with, this, with the coronavirus, the COVID-19 situation. Contact tracing, testing, you have to test, contact tracing, testing, and, and isolation of the, of the asymptomatically positive and the, and the infected. And it works, it works every single time. Now, you have to put certain measures in place. And what I think the Nigerians did in 93 days, you know, it's a documentary, 
the Nigerians actually did. Uh, they set up um, hotlines, anonymous hotlines, where you could you could call in and say, "Oh, I'm sick" or whatever, and you could you could get taken care of, uh, and you wouldn't have to share uh, information that you don't want to share. I think a mistake that's been made in various places, and, and I think we made a mistake here in New York, is is if you turn this into a law enforcement problem, it's sending the wrong message. You need it to be a community healthcare problem with a community healthcare workforce. You don't want any impediment to somebody getting early care. Mm. And that's important, especially in communities of color where there's, there may be economic uh, or other reasons why you don't, you don't want someone to walk into an urgent care facility if they're concerned about COVID-19, for example, and be, or, or be, not be able to do that because someone's gonna ask them if they're legal or not. That's exactly the wrong it is not a law enforcement problem. And I think the Nigerians really did it well that way. In the movie 93 Days, we're introduced to the concept of fomites. What's a, what's a fomite? Well, a fomite is stuff that stuff sticks to. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's, the, it's, the, you know, it's your glasses, it's your, you know, it's your phone, it's, it's whatever something could stick to and, and persist on for a certain length of time. That's not direct transmission. So if I cough in your face, then that's direct transmission. If I uh, if I snog my wife, then that's direct transmission. Uh, a glass where that's wet is probably more direct transmission. Than if you're you're doing fomites, fomites are are things that are inanimate. And the question then is, uh, how long can a virus stay viable on that, and then transmit to somebody else? So it's it's a bible in your church. It's a subway pole. It's a subway pool, exactly. It's a doorknob. The true story of the Gupta's film, 93 Days, depicts a thriving, wealthy, modern Africa, rarely seen in American movies. And while there is tragedy, there's no human villain, no, and also no spunky rebel bucking the system, disregarding orders. All the Nigerian doctors comport themselves heroically within the rules of science and safety. Not so much in Soderbergh's Contagion. Dr. Ian Sussman, played by Elliot Gould, defies protocol to keep working on a sample of the deadly virus in his subpar containment facility. But maybe the real question is, Mark, would you want Elliot Gould to play you in a movie? Uh, I'd be honored if Elliot Gould would play me in a movie. I was hoping for somebody younger. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've been a great fan of Elliot, Elliot Gould for a long time. Maybe Seth Rogen, would that be okay? Um, <laughs> Listen, Dr. Sussman, oh my God. Uh, it's so, you know, there are so many things that are prescient and, and knowledgeable about this movie, and yet this is one that's sort of upside down. I, I object, and we've talked about this before on your show, I, I object to this idea of the mad scientist trope. Not just like the, the Dr. Moreau type, but also anybody who isn't following protocol. And there's a really good reason for this. And it's even when, even this guy, this guy's made out to be some sort of hero. He's told to shut his lab down because he doesn't have the right protocols. He's not BSL-4, he's BSL-2 or something like that. But he goes ahead and tinkers away anyway, and he manages to find bat cells that allow the virus to grow. If we can grow it, we can make a vaccine. Well, first of all, that's not even true. But there is a real story. Did you know the last cases of smallpox, there's two different kinds of smallpox. They were in the mid to late 1970s. 1978, this poor woman, Janet Parker, as a photographer in the UK, she comes down with weird symptoms and so forth, and she breaks out, and she's got smallpox. Well, this is after smallpox has been eradicated and declared eradicated by the World Health Organization, and suddenly this woman's got smallpox. Well, it, it turns out that what happened was, is this guy who was supposed to get rid of all of his smallpox stores, just like Dr. Sussman, his name was Henry Benson, he actually was still playing with it is in an experimental way in his lab. It got loose, it went up through the ducts, the ventilation ducts. She got infected, she died. Her father died. And then the next day, Henry Benson went out into his shed after writing a, a note saying that he was ashamed for what he had caused. And he was really concerned that he had released smallpox back into the wild after it was eradicated and he slit his own throat. There is no good reason for not following protocol. There's no heroism. We as Americans love it. Well, you know, there's a lot of heroism to be, honestly, the heroism in, in 93 Days strikes me much more poignantly than what you see in Contagion. There is so much in Contagion that mirrors our real lives in this COVID-19 outbreak, but a, a couple of other sciencey things in the movie need to be cleared up. For instance, Dr. Ali Hextall bypasses large-scale human trials by injecting herself with the vaccine she created, then exposes herself to her infected father, 
which is a nice family drama, but does that fictional sequence of events warp our real life expectations of the vaccination that we're all so very desperate to have? Right. I think there's a lot of warping on the whole idea of, of vaccines and how you get there and how to, it's, vaccines are really, really hard. You know, um, she, what does she do? She injects herself with a vaccine and then she kisses her father on the forehead. That doesn't prove, and then she doesn't get infected. So what does that prove? Well, I don't know, maybe she should have kissed her father on the lips. Maybe she should have like taken some sputum out of his nose and sucked on that or something. You know, there are a lot of reasons why you won't get infected when you're exposed to somebody. There are plenty of people with COVID-19 who've been exposed to relatives and, and, and not gotten infected. There's, it's not as sort of cut and, cut and dry as that. And even in terms of injecting herself with a vaccine, and it, does that prove that it's safe? Well, it proves that it's safe for her. But does it prove that it's safe for somebody who's 75 years old? Does it prove that it's safe for somebody of a different ethnic background? Does it prove that it's safe for somebody who's on immunosuppressive drugs? Is it safe for everybody? What you know, we don't even measure immunity in terms of individuals. We measure it in terms of populations. Here's the huge plot hole with that. She injects herself, and I guess the vaccine is safe, right? And then she like it, it exposes herself to her father. She doesn't, this is like the big watershed moment for the vaccine. So why is the vaccine down the road injected and sprayed up people's nose? It's, it's, a, it's, an, it's an inhaled vaccine that they actually distribute to people, not the injected one. And so injecting yourself in the leg is irrelevant. Yes, but the dramatic moment of sticking something up your nose and going is really not pleasant, so. You know, vaccines are complicated things, and immunity is a complicated thing, too. Uh, just a quick example. You, with COVID-19, with, with SARS-CoV-2, making somebody immune could be bad, because if you induce the wrong kind of immunity, here's a good example, dengue. If you get infected with dengue, dengue fever virus, and then you recover from it, if you get infected a second time, the antibodies you've got to the first time can actually kill you because they act, they, like a Trojan horse, they, they, they make a way for that virus to get into your immune cells and mess you up. We already know that a lot of the pathology associated with COVID-19 is from your immune system overreacting, mm -hmm. not underreacting. So you need to induce the right kind of immunity, neutralizing antibodies, not something that's gonna make your immune system go haywire. This is hard, hard work done by very talented people. It is not gonna happen in 133 days. Well, okay, okay, so well, what, let's talk about immunity. And, and Matt Damon is, early in the, in the movie, he's, he's declared immune. Was he immune? Was he lucky? What, is, what, what, what does it mean to be, in the context of the movie, what does it mean to be immune? Well, so I think they're confusing immunity and susceptibility, and our lack of susceptibility. There, there's no evidence, or maybe there is. It's hard to say. Look, so it, it, he talks. They talk about whether or not his daughter has inherited this immunity. Immunity is not heritable. Susceptibility can be. So if I go out and I get infected with uh, the virus in the movie, I I can't pass that to my kid any more than I can pass like the the scar I got on my elbow when I fell off my bike when I was five. I healed from that, that doesn't get transferred to my kid. Susceptibility is different. So susceptibility can actually be structured by genetics. And we've seen this on the positive and the negative side. A really good example uh, is when the H1N1 flu went around, I think in 2009, um, the, uh, those uh, Aboriginal Australian and Alaskan native populations had an unusually high mortality rate associated with H1, H1N1. And it turns out that there are, there's a genetic linkage uh, to these things called um, HLA, major histocompatibility haplotypes. It's not, it's, what's important is that these are proteins on your cells that show you, that show your immune system what an invading virus protein looks like, right? And if they do a terrible job at it, if they don't present it well so it can't be seen well, then your immune system's not going to respond well and you're, you're more susceptible to pathology and death. And it turns out that there's a few of these haplotypes, these varieties that are, happen to be prominent in uh, Australian Aboriginal people and in, in Alaskan. We even know already with COVID-19, and this is work that just came out like five days ago, there are certain haplotypes, uh, H, these, these major histocompatibility compatib HLA haplotypes that uh, are more associated with disease and others that seem to be less associated with severe disease. So there does seem to be some kind of linkage. Okay, so Matt Damon, 
did he have one of these things that protects him or did he just have a rider in his contract that says, I'm not going to wear a mask? Uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know. And, or maybe, maybe, maybe he's a super spreader typhoid Mary who's got it the whole time and spreading it to everybody. And that's why we have a movie. Well, he is saying he does present his immunity as like germ Teflon. Like it doesn't stick to me. It doesn't, it doesn't spread from me. It doesn't work like that. Even if you're immune, let's say uh, you, you got, uh, did you have measles or did you get a, a vaccine when you were a kid? Vaccine. Okay. I actually. Chickenpox. Chicken pox. I've had chickenpox. Yeah. So I actually got vaccinated against measles like everybody else. And then I got measles. So vaccines are not perfect, right? Uh, and they're not force fields that stand three feet outside of your body and prevent viruses from getting in. They prevent you from getting sick. They tend to prevent you from transmitting because if you're not sick, you tend not to transmit. If you're not sneezing, coughing, whatever, you're not going to transmit it. But it's not perfect. If you got measles when you were a kid, you're probably, you know, very 98%, you're not going to give it to anybody if it comes around again. But if you got a vaccine when you were a kid, when measles is in community transmission, there's a 20% chance you're going to get it, not feel it, not get disease, but that you're going to give it to somebody else or that you could give it to somebody else. So are we fomites? Are we, are we sticky? Are we? <laughs> are we? Uh, we well, so <laughs> fomites, fomites are supposed to be inanimate things. We're vectors. <laughs> vectors. We're vectors. We're little steamy globs of vectory goo. And you know, this is really important too. We don't know that immunity to, let's say you've had COVID-19 and you've recovered. We don't know that that means, well, in fact, we know you can get it again. That doesn't mean you're going to get sick again, but it does mean you can get it and possibly harbor it and possibly transmit it. Vaccines are terrific at preventing outbreaks and pandemics. They're not as good at stamping them down. I mean, obviously, it'd be great to have that, but we need to do other things. Look what the Nigerians did. Contact tracing, testing, isolation, repeat. That is what does it every single time. Vaccine or no vaccine. In the movie, uh, Matt Damon plays this overprotective dad, but and then in the last little bits of the movie, he allows his unvaccinated daughter to come in very close contact with the hottie so desperate to swap spit with her because Hottie got vaccinated. Is Matt Damon gonna live to regret that? Listen, I think Matt Damon's character would live to regret not letting the two of them have prom night together uh, more than he would live to regret anything else. I certainly would as a, as a father. Well, your daughter wouldn't let you forget that. Ever. Did the science mistakes that this movie make make the job of scientists more complicated? You know, it, it, Marshall McLuhan, the medium is the message kind of, you know, how much of our approach as a society to COVID-19 is, is, is predicted or even structured by things like uh, contagion or outbreak or the hot zone or, or, or what have you. And, and, and that's, that's impossible to, to figure out. I think, I, I, think the, the, I think the biggest problem that I've got with contagion from that point of view is is the whole and it's you know it's it's a there's a couple of writing devices in there to shorten things down to get it down to vaccine in 133 days i think the expectation that we're not going to get out of covid 19 without a vaccine is is, mis is misguided and wrong and i think it's actually uh uh been a problem because i think we could have done better as a society and still can do better as a society pressuring our politicians for more testing and more contact rate. You need to hire a massive healthcare workforce like we did in 1918. New York City hired thousands of people to be contact tracers and educators from the communities that they lived in to get out there and try to, to try to limit the spread. And they did, a, they did a terrific job. New York City didn't really have a, a, a second wave. I'm also concerned about this idea of like, so we saw this in China, with COVID-19, we certainly saw it in the movie, this like having your little RFID barcode kind of thing that tells you you got vaccinated or I'm immune or whatever. I mean, we don't really, as I said before, we don't really measure immunity on an individual basis. We measure it on a population basis. Having a vaccine, having been vaccinated, doesn't prove you're immune. It means you're probably immune. But you know, if you've got like uh, measles running around in Brooklyn, as it did, I think, last year. 
uh, 93% of the people who are vaccinated are, are going to be immune. That means almost 10% of the people are not immune, and even though they were vaccinated. This is a, co this is a community problem. If, I'm, um, if, I, if I can't take care of my family, uh, if I can't go back to work unless I've got a badge of immunity and there's no, and there's no vaccine like current situation with COVID-19, and I'm under 50, which I'm not, but suppose I was, uh, the, 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 the risk to me of catching COVID-19 is lower than the risk of not being able to take care of my family. And so you've just incentivized my going out to, to healthcare facilities and hospitals and looking at people's faces if they're sick. You don't ever want to incentivize bad behavior. The film Contagion starts with a cough. And as you know, anyone caught coughing on a TV or movie screen will be dead within the hour. And even top star Gwyneth Paltrow could not save her character from the quick death that always follows a cinematic cough. But from that cough, we learned some interesting scientific concepts like the r naught ratio. Mark, what is an r naught ratio? You know, Contagion does a really good job of several things. r naught is one of them, but also BSL-4 labs and the positive pressure suit and things like that. I'm really impressed with the thought that went into it. They must have had terrific scientific advisors, uh, in which if anybody needs a scientific advisor, I can help. But r naught. so at its basic, the R naught is uh, the basic reproductive ratio. And this is basically the number of people that you, that an individual is likely to, on average, uh, infect while they are infected on the assumption that nobody's immune. And so if nobody has immunity, how many people will you contact? How many of those are gonna get infected? Uh, and, and so, so it's a reproductive ratio. In the paper today, they said that, that the current r not of COVID was one, and they were distressed about it. Yes? Well, one's a lot. Below one usually means that it's going to burn out. Right. Because you're going to infect fewer people than you, which obviously doesn't happen on a one-to-one -one basis. I've seen estimates, and it, these, these are very, very dependent on socioeconomic and other matters. So the r not in the Upper West Side is not going to be the same as the r not in the Bronx. It's not going to be the same as the r not in, in Lagos. So it has to do with how people are interacting. What the objective of wearing, say, masks or social distancing is to drop that r not down below a point where the doubling time is too quick. SARS, the elder in 2002, 2003, had an r not less than one, which meant that it would probably burn out. You don't want an R naught up around five because oh. that's polio. And then measles is like 15. So one person gets infected and it's a wildfire. You know, one of the things that you found to be very truthful and contagion was Sanjay Gupta giving equal airtime to both the head of the CDC and Jude Law's crackpot conspiracy blogger who is both plugging and profiting from a homeopathic drug called Forsythia. In your work at the Carter Center in the eradication of the guinea more, more mark, how, how did you overcome disinformation? Well, I mean, thankfully, not too many epidemics or pandemics have a problem with uh, a head of state spouting off dangerous <laughs> misinformation about things like chloroquine or injecting bleach into your body to get rid of it. Um, yeah, I actually found the Gupta thing to be really, uh, I don't know if it's, it was prescient then or if it was real then, the idea that you have to give equal time to fact and fiction. This is what balanced journalism is these days. Uh, but, but uh, you know, disinformation, most people can identify. Misinformation is a little bit more insidious and, and a little more difficult to deal with. And I think the important thing, it doesn't matter where you are, you need to find local and culturally relevant ways to actually communicate information to people. If you have signs with words on it in a place where people can't read, that's not very, very useful. When I was with the Taposa people in Eastern Equatoria and in, 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 in South Sudan, they communicated the idea of a guinea worm transmission and how to get in front of it through song and dance and play acting. And it was, it was as, as compelling and beautiful to me watching it as watching an opera when I don't know the words that are being sung. There are other places that use textiles. There are other places that, that use other media that are relevant. It has to be locally driven. It has to be locally relevant. And then it works. Well, our problem is that, is that the disinformation campaigns are locally relevant to us in extreme. Yes, unfortunately. You know, Mark, you travel the world. You chase bugs and epidemics and worms. Do you ever feel, do you ever feel like you're in danger? 
I get sick all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I'm adventurous when it comes to the food that I eat and the, I, I want to, when I go to, I don't know, I mean, the last time was Madagascar and I was holding onto a toilet seat for three days to keep from getting stratospheric and airborne. Uh, it, Cambodia before that, uh, it, it, I want to experience everything. And it's also about risk assessment. So I'm not, I know I'm not going to die of food poisoning if I can keep myself hydrated. I'm just going to have to take some drugs for a couple of days like that. The things that really scare me and make me worried in the field are men with guns never women with guns for some reason, just men with guns. And then getting injured, getting injured in a place that is seven days from any kind of help. But there's one thing that I've learned having traveled the globe as a, as a field biologist and environmental biologist is that it doesn't matter if you don't know the language. It doesn't matter how scared you are. It doesn't matter uh, if you don't know what's going to happen next. There are going to be people around you that will take care of you. There's this fundamental human thing to care about each other that you can rely on. And I think that's where contagion got it wrong. This idea that society is going to break down and people are going to be all, you know, this, we're only held together because of society. No, we're human and we care about each other. And you can count on that wherever you go. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you so much for spending, for spending an afternoon with us in your own study, in your own home. I'm very happy to be here with you and, and, and thanks for asking me to come on.